Welcome to The Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. And welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So over 200 students have been arrested and face other consequences across campuses across the nation, including Columbia University. And this headline coming from Fox News that now college protesters want amnesty as they await consequences of anti-Israel demonstrations. This should also say pro-terror demonstrations. Uh, but this article goes on to say as anti-Israel protests linger across college campuses nationwide, many students are awaiting the consequences consequences of taking part in these demonstrations. For many, final exams, financial aid, and even graduation are on the line, and their plight has become a central part of the protests. Students and professors alike have demanded amnesty. That issue is whether universities and law enforcement will clear the charges and withhold other consequences or whether the suspensions and legal records will follow students into their adult lives. So joining me now to discuss all this and more is Alex McFarland, who is host of Exploring the Word on the American Family Radio Network, where I also host Jenna Ellis in the morning each and every weekday. And Alex's show is on from uh, 3 to 4 Central Time, 4 to 5 Eastern Time. Alex, you're also a prolific uh, worldview scholar and apologetics author. So thanks so much for joining me. Um, what is your take about all of these protests that that have become riots and some even turning in, into violence and the arrest with now these students who are exercising civil disobedience um, in their view, but now they want amnesty and no consequences for breaking the law? Well, Jenna, thanks for having me on. And, you know, it's just uh, hard to believe that the American college campus that ostensibly is raising and grooming our next generation of leaders is actually uh, tolerating and even encouraging lawlessness. And it, it really does make us pause and shudder to think about the state of leadership in the future for our for our nation. But Jenna, it's not really surprising to me that they would demand absolution from accountability to the law, because these are the same masses that are demanding absolution from the responsibility to pay their tuition and their, their student loan, uh, uh, those that have incurred student loans. And so this is problematic on so many reasons. Um, you've spent much of your life in academia, so have I. Uh, colleges should be places of decorum, uh, truth, the pursuit of knowledge, not lawlessness, and give me what I want at any demand, or I'll torch the place. What a horrible precedent we're watching before us. Yes, yeah, so well said. And, you know, as other commentators have suggested, Alex, the inmates are now running the asylum. I mean, this is just goes back to basic respect for authority. And college administrators have seemed to have forgotten uh, the fact that they are responsible for the genuine education, but also the rules enforcement at universities. I mean, to say nothing about the laws of civil society that are being broken, but even just the decorum and the rules of academic institutions. And yet, um, um, you know, as you and I discussed earlier today on my radio program, you know this is all about the social justice warrior and about um, the left and the Marxist students who have who want to take advantage of now amnesty or the First Amendment, for example, but they're manipulating those definitions to fit their own crimes and their own agenda. They don't truly want to see any sort of consequences. They just want to see the world capitulate to their particular perspective. And unfortunately, a lot of administrators are going along with it. Yes, uh, indeed. And, you know, college administrators, not to mention, you know, public school system administrators, here across America for a number of years have really been so like, uh, for lack of a better term, nervous Nellies that they just capitulate wherever there's a demand, wherever there's just threat of protest or PR or litigation, 
administrators just generally roll over and play dead. And we're seeing that at, at not all, but many of the colleges. L- let me just say this, Jenna. Um, it, it's, it's always been understood that when a student enrolls at a college and you matriculate into a degree program, that's a privilege, not a right. Most colleges at one time you know, have or had like a student code of conduct, because really attending a school is a bit of a social contra- uh, contract, that you're agreeing to abide by the rules. You're, most schools had an honor code that you had to sign that you would be honest and turn in your own work. And one of the things that these uh, protesters, which are really part of a larger social justice movement we've seen really for about 15 years, they'll say, you know, healthcare is a human right. Um, Good Wi-Fi access is a human right. And they will say that education is a human right. Well, for all of history, education, as needful as it is, as wonderful as it is, is a privilege. And privileges are things that are really to be earned and valued, not demanded. But these protesters, Jenna, and, and I've looked at hundreds of pictures, and it, it seems like some group, I don't know who, did a bulk buy of tents, because the tents, the sleeping bags, you know, I, I'm not a conspiratorial kind of guy, but it's looking well-funded, well-organized, very intentional, and I think this is all part of a larger plan to not only support the terrorists, which is what they're doing, but to really uh, destabilize and ultimately weaken the United States of America, Jenna. Yeah, well, Alex, I mean, it's not a it's not a conspiracy theory if the evidence points to and suggests that this was coordinated. And there's a lot of evidence uh, to to support that theory. And there have been some reports even suggesting that potentially George Soros is behind this. And there's um, that, that's an interesting proposition because George Soros is Jewish. But at the same time, we also know that he is a woke leftist Marxist. And so even yeah. you know, I mean, people can point to Joe Biden and say, well, he's Catholic, but he's very pro-abortion and he's very anti anti-Christian and a lot of other things that his faith or his heritage don't necessarily inform his politics or his worldview. So I wouldn't personally see this as inconsistent with the left's already inconsistencies to think that someone like George Soros is behind this. And so I want to hold you over into the next segment, Alex, because there's so much more to unpack here as far as um, the agenda and the purpose behind the left's uh, demonstrations here and their total inconsistencies in their worldview when we see these students who, yeah, they want to take part in academics, but they don't actually want to go along with the academic structure or any of the rules on campus. So we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path, and now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition, one ounce, 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party, under Speaker Gingrich's guidance, took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now.
continuing my conversation with Alex McFarland, who's the host of Exploring the Word on the American Family Radio Network, that you can always catch the replay on demand at AFR.net. Alex is also a prolific worldview and apologetics author. And this really does, Alex, boil down to worldview, because while there is a commentary about you know what may have influenced all of these students, I think you're right, as we were discussing at the end of the last segment, that this does appear to be a coordinated effort. And we do know how easily uh, students can be influenced. I mean, I, I remember even when I was a professor at Colorado Christian University, uh, how much, unfortunately, even Christian students had this compartmentalized view of my faith is on Sundays, but then I can be a social justice warrior the other six days of the week. And they didn't really see, some of them, how inconsistent those two worldviews are. Uh, what do you make of this worldview that's that's being um, exposed on these campuses and how truly inconsistent it is with truth? Uh, great, great question. And uh, let me just say, Jenna, as always, it's uh, very enlightening and enjoyable to converse with you, and I appreciate being on. Um, you know, you got to understand, folks, that our universities for a large um, segment are being run by, uh, if not the actual flower children and hippies of 50 years ago, um, still the worldview of the, the 60s, this utopianism. And in the previous segment, Jenna, you and I were talking about you know how George Soros, uh, a Hungarian Holocaust survivor, Jewish himself, how could he be anti-Israel and pro-Hamas? But what it is, I mean, if you read his website, the Open Society's website, where he uses his uh, billions of dollars and he operates many, many foundations, funded by his own money and the money of others, Soros is a globalist. Um, and even though he himself ethnically is Jewish, you know, he really doesn't appear to have any loyalty to the state of Israel, certainly none to America. And, and here is the worldview, the foundation point. Everyone has an ultimate thing in their life, a summum bonum, in other words, a God. And if you do not know the true God, the God of the Bible, uh, you will follow a God of your own making. And in terms of the, whether it be these, these woke college students that are uh, protesting, they don't even know what. I mean, there was footage. It, it would be laughable if it weren't so tragically pathetic. And this was even on CNN, protesters that are, they don't even know what they're protesting. They don't know that they're supporting genocide and standing against the only stable democracy in the Middle East, the nation of Israel. But, but here's the thing. Everybody has a God in their life, whether they realize it or not. And in the case of like Soros and the globalists, they are against the, what stands between them and this utopia, this deity they hope to build. Um, what stands against this Marxist global utopia is Christianity, the United States, the nation of Israel, and the nuclear family. That's why all of these things are in the crosshairs, Jenna. Yeah, so well said. And I think uh, that is a perfect articulation of why um, Americans need to support Israel beyond just the foreign policy consideration, just beyond uh, that that uh, Israel is our ally and that there are democratic values that are in place. We can talk about all of the politics, but if we look at the basic worldview that underpins all of this, there is a significant trend, and we've talked about it in this program before, um, from especially Gen Xers that are Gen Gen Zers, rather, that um, the, the younger generation that are uh, so pro-America, they almost are America alone, rather than seeing how being pro-Israel is actually part of what makes America and, and ultimately nation states great, because they're refusing, or, or perhaps they haven't been very well educated, into the whole understanding of a worldview for Western civilization. And so they see this as only my interests, which I think is very short-sighted, Alex. Yeah, you know, that's been one of the great things about America, that we have had good foreign policy, and it's not been at the uh, compromise of our own interest. And let me just encourage people, we are in an election year, obviously, as we vote, 
we need to send to Washington and certainly to the Oval Office um, leaders that first and foremost understand the Constitution. You know, uh, Jenna, I, I could say understand their responsibility to defend the Constitution. We need elected officials who actually understand the the Declaration, Preamble, Constitution, Bill of Rights, uh, but listen, are committed to advocate for the interests of American citizens. And some of the interests of American citizens would include responsible and wise foreign policy. And, and Jenna, I've said this many times, the greatest favor any president could do the American people is to be a good friend to the nation of Israel. I, I mean, mm -hmm. Israel, like nations from time immemorial, Individuals and nations have the right to self-defense. Let's remember October 7, 2023, it was Israel that was attacked. Hamas attacked Israel. And so we would not fault any people or nation for engaging in self-defense. But Israel is held to a double standard. And we need uh, leaders that exhibit good foreign policy skills. Let me say just one other thing. Um, after the attacks of last October, I was in a number of pro-Israel, stand with Israel rallies, not only on the East Coast, but in Colorado. And I was talking with college students, and they were, of course, uh, even some from a Christian university um, were saying, you know, from the river to the sea, Gaza must be free. And so we were talking about indigenous people. Now, here's the thing about the woke mindset of recent years. The rights of indigenous people are, you know, very prominent uh, in Canada, the Aboriginal uh, and Indian tribes and Native Americans. Well, you know, I said, so you, you support the rights of indigenous people? Yes. Well, what group could possibly be more indigenous, more native to the, the land of Israel than the Israelites? You know, so again, yeah. there's this double standard. It, you know, all about yeah, the rights of course of there is. And, and, and none of this, Alex, makes sense because it's always that the left wants to reinvent these terms like indigenous to simply serve their own purposes. And they are intentionally harnessing language and terms and trying to divest them of their actual plain meaning and impute their own meaning to it so that they can reinvent reality according to how they want. But we're already out of time for this segment. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Well, friends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza extravaganza. Two pack multi use my pillows are just $25. My pillow sandals also awesome. Only $25. Their six pack towel sets are $25 and brand new four pack dish towels. You guessed it, just $25 for the first time ever. The premium, my pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25 and orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to mypillow.com, Use the promo code Jenna or call 800-564- 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475, or go to mypillow.com and use the promo code Jenna. So some Christian universities have been a beacon of sanity amidst all of this ridiculous pro-terror nonsense. That includes Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, this headline from Fox News saying Liberty University holds massive public prayer gathering as anti-Israel mobs get arrested at Columbia USC. Chancellor Jonathan Falwell contrasted Liberty University's gathering to anti-Israel protests that are, quote, erupting in anger hatred, and violence. The private Christian university located in Lynchburg, Virginia, held a massive gathering on the campus academic 
lawn Wednesday evening that went widely unnoticed as there were no arrests, no anti-Israel or anti-Jewish sentiments. Instead, the massive crowd joined together to pray, worship, and read the Bible. So, quote, well, so many campuses are erupting in anger, hatred, and violence, it is refreshing to see the students at Liberty University reflecting the love of Christ as we are commanded to do by scripture. Jonathan Falwell, the Liberty University chancellor and pastor of Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, who delivered a sermon at Wednesday's gathering, told Fox News Digital. He went on to say, Jesus clearly tells us to love, and it is so telling that in higher education today, it seems as if some of the only places where love is being displayed are from the campuses of Christian universities like Liberty. Joining me now is Ryan Helfenbein, who is the Vice President of Communications at Liberty University and also the Executive Director of the Standing for Freedom Center. So, Ryan, uh, Liberty has been a very different campus in a lot of different ways, and it's actually sad that this kind of went unnoticed because students there uh, actually are reflecting the love of Christ and they're law-abiding. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we're going to just show you our faith by what it is that we do. And at Liberty University, I could not be more proud of these students um, just demonstrating the love of Christ. And this, I'll just tell you, this is a regular gathering on Wednesday. It just so happened that this this gathering on Wednesday coincided with everything else that was going on across the country. This is campus community. This is a regular kind of meeting that we have at Liberty University where thousands of students come together to worship, to pray together, uh, to read the scriptures, have a sermon. Um, all of those things uh, are a part of our regular spiritual community um, office of spiritual development here at Liberty University. So this is not unusual. Um, this is something you would experience if you were visiting campus on any given week during the semester, you could partake in this kind of experience. Yeah, and, and I know this to be true uh, for effect because my little brother, and I'm very proud of him, will be graduating from Liberty University in just a couple of weeks. And he has spent the last four years at Liberty um, growing in his faith and you know, definitely getting a great education in his chosen field, um, but also the spiritual development side and, um, and a deeper understanding of worldview, Ryan, as well. I mean, this is yeah. a campus that invests in the student's whole life, not just academics and not just in indoctrination of using students for these woke leftist propositions. And so, um, you know, the, the difference here and the contrast between what Liberty University is doing compared to these woke leftist institutions could not be more clear. And we need more universities like Liberty. Uh, why do you think it is that the main academic institutions that were originally founded on Christian principles have gone so far left? Yeah, that's, it's a great question. I mean, it's, this took place over time, right? You, you look at Harvard University, Yale, Princeton, uh, many Ivy League institutions were founded as seminaries first and foremost for the training of pastors uh, so they could rightly divide the word of truth. They could actually study the scriptures and then be able to preach them, exposit them, teach them. Um, many through through decades and even the centuries had given up the, the ghost, so to speak. They had forfeited uh, the Christian faith in favor of secular academics, in favor of uh, the Enlightenment Project. Uh, Liberty University was founded in 1971 by Dr. Jerry Falwell, and he wanted an evangelical institution that would be faithful to the Gospels first and foremost, but also wanted to um, found a, a academic university um, that had a law school, that had a business school, uh, a school of engineering, school of education, nursing, um, medicine, all of those things are practiced here. So students can come here and get all of those experiences. But look, you cannot forfeit the gospel and not expect this kind of stuff to result. And so in these academic environments, they believed in the hollowness of secularism. The secularism would somehow deliver the same kinds of goods, the same kind of experience, uh, but without the root foundation of the Christian faith. And that doesn't happen. You can't lay an ax to an orchard tree and expect to still receive apples. Uh, so we're, we're living by the byproducts of, of the Christian society at large that existed a long time ago. Part of our informal establishment, by the way, uh, when we came together as a country, informal establishment was that we were a Christian society. Uh, and so we lived off of these fruits for a long time. 
Liberty University is the place where it is still practiced and believed today. And, and it's why uh, the graduates from Liberty are flourishing and they're being productive members of society and going on to their professions with an understanding of uh, truth and, as you said, rightly dividing truth from error. And when we look at these other universities, Ryan, it's so obvious that we can't separate uh, faith and truth from academic disciplines and and suggest that everything is secular and doesn't have any sort of moral component at all. Otherwise, you get to where these other universities are and these students that really can't measure the difference between right and wrong. They can only measure the difference maybe between Republican and Democrat. And if that's all that we're teaching future students, is political party affiliation, then we've lost an entire sense of what it means to be a moral and upright society. So we only have about a minute left, but your response to that. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Uh, you look at, let's contrast what's happening at Columbia University is a prime example. Uh, this was basically ground zero uh, for um, critical theory. Uh, Herbert Marcuse, uh, back in the 1930s, the Frankfurt School. Christless conservatism, on the other hand, is completely dead. And so when you don't have the kernel of truth in there, you just have the husk, guess what? you're gonna abandon conservatism at the end of the day. It must be bedrock truth, and it is founded on Jesus Christ. If you're a conservative, you will believe in the life-giving truth of the gospel. Yeah, so well said. And to be a conservative, just meaning that maybe you're pro-capitalism or you're pro a couple of these other philosophies, ultimately then you have this piecemeal worldview that is incoherent and isn't cohesive. And we're seeing the breakdown between the genuine conservatives who understand that's rooted in something versus these kind of you know popcorn conservatives that don't really have a lot of substance. But Ryan, I want to hold you into the next segment um, to talk about another headline. And again, so appreciate Liberty University. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path, and now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition, one ounce, 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party, under Speaker Gingrich's guidance, took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now. Continuing to talk with Ryan Helfenbein, the Vice President of Communications at Liberty University and also the Executive Director of the Standing for Freedom Center. And Ryan, um, you've been talking about the worldviews implicit in these college campus protests and how uh, students are being indoctrinated by these uh, supposedly secular universities that do have a worldview bias. Everyone has a lens by which they view the world. And when we look at the college campuses that are suggesting now that social justice or that justice really means a pro-terror, uh, like some of these uh, protests are mm -hmm. asserting, and when we look at what the, the term even social justice warrior has meant, uh, we kind of look at the worldview uh, lens that is even wider. And this headline was from New Max World today, the ICC is moving to indict Netanyahu, Israeli leaders for war crimes. The International Criminal Court, or the ICC, is preparing arrest warrants for senior Israeli officials for alleged war crimes, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a revelation that has drawn silence, if not acceptance, from the Biden administration. Sources told the New York Times the charges stem from Israel preventing delivery of humanitarian aid, which Israeli officials have said they fear just one 
winds up in the hands of Hamas terrorists amid the war started by Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack. Netanyahu reportedly is on the list of Israeli government officials to be issued ICC arrest warrants. And so, Ryan, um, this headline just dropped moments ago. And so um, I'll get some commentary, hopefully tomorrow, from, um, you know, a, a, a an attorney that is versed in um, international law, which I am not um, at all. But just from a political and a worldview perspective, you know, this is very concerning to me that you have the ICC that's willing to come down hard on a, a sovereign nation for defending itself simply because they don't want this aid to fall into the hands of terrorists and their literal opponents in war. Yet we see nothing from the ICC or the Biden administration about Hamas. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Look, I had um, I had the opportunity to take part um, in a special envoy, a special delegation of evangel evangelicals who visited the Israeli embassy here in the United States, um, had a special briefing uh, regarding October the 7th, the most horrific uh, pictures that I saw of violence um, on that day. Over 1,200 Israelis lost their life, some Jewish, some Christian, some secular, but all of them Israeli citizens uh, who were viciously attacked by Hamas on that day. Uh, there are over 100 um, uh, hostages currently, victims right now, that are being held um, in captivity for ransom. Uh, but 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 are being used as political pawns in this game. The BDS movement boycott, divest, and sanction is very pervasive. It's widespread. There are many um, members of the UN uh, that have BDS sympathies that are anti-Israeli. Um, that are they've been calling for genocide uh, even moments after the October seventh attack. They didn't even wait, and the propaganda machine was already beginning to work. Jenna, uh, even in the news, uh, even in the news cycle, um, there were outlets that were already spewing. Um, all kinds of propagation that were coming from Hamas on the ground in Gaza. They were already clamoring for uh, human rights violations and genocide against the Israeli government uh, without the facts actually coming out. So I would be very suspicious of this uh, from the ICC. I, I know that the Israeli government is not perfect. I, I recognize that there are going to be, just like many of us, there's going to be information that's out there. Um, there's certainly collateral, collateral damage that has been suffered. Uh, suffered, uh, you know, People on the ground have suffered as a result of this war. Uh, even Christian communities that are in Palestine that have been around for a long time have suffered a, as a part of collateral damage. But we, we, cannot ha we cannot be naive when it comes to our understanding of Hamas, a terrorist organization that has run that place since something like 2006, um, they've had total control and they are in control of the information on the ground that is being delivered in real time and that has been curated by them. Um, so there is a lot of misinformation right now. Um, and I think that all of us are waiting for the real facts uh, th that are gonna be delivered um, in time. Yeah, really well said, Ryan. And, you know, my my just initial reaction to this headline is how much the ICC is now putting pressure on Israel uh, to basically allow the funding of a terrorist regime uh, that is Hamas and to not be able to effectively uh, determine as a sovereign nation how to proceed and to respond to these attacks. And, you know, obviously there are rules of engagement. Um, there are, uh, you know, th there's the Geneva Convention. There's all of these other things um, in terms of international international uh, war crimes and what, what constitutes that, but to suggest uh, so quickly as well. I mean, this, this isn't even years after the fact, uh, like the ICC has done with some former Nazis, for example, like literal Nazis, um, not just, you know, who, who people would term, you know, anybody you disagree with is a Nazi now in today's culture, but literally. Um, so when, when they go and after the fact, are, are punishing or holding accountable uh, some of these, these individuals that in their estimation have perpetuated war crimes to do this in the midst of an ongoing conflict and to even issue an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu to me is just, um, it's, it's interference in Israel's ability to defend itself. And I think sends a very stark message to the rest of the world about um, the very notion of justice and 
is concerning from a kind of a one world government perspective that if Israel is a sovereign nation has to be concerned about their prime minister getting hauled off on an arrest warrant, how much of a chilling effect is that going to be on other uh, future sovereign nations who may need to defend themselves and now they're worried about the ICC? Yeah, no, I, you're, you hit the nail on the head. In fact, this is a part of our, our own failure in American diplomacy and American leadership. If America was leading right now, I guarantee you the ICC wouldn't even be bringing forth these charges or feel that it was empowered to do so. Look, on 9-11, all of us witnessed what happened, 4,000 Americans who died uh, by terrorist attack. Uh, no one blamed uh, at least in that moment, because you look at all the senators, they were voting along with uh, the White House. Uh, no one blamed uh, the response internationally uh, when when all of a sudden George W. Bush said, hey, look, you know, we're going to go and we're going to root out terrorists wherever they exist. And whoever harbors terrorists is, is an enemy of the United States and an enemy of the West. We recognize in that moment what needed to happen. Look, Israel had their 9-11. Uh, they're in the midst of a war right now. You're absolutely right. This is not time for a post-mortem. We come to the end of this, and then we can start to lay blame and what happened and when. I absolutely agree. A hundred hostages right now whose lives are at stake and how we behave in this moment, yeah. their lives could depend on it. Absolutely. So, and Ryan, I so appreciate you being willing to tackle this headline that just came out. I couldn't agree more. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight for the most bizarre headline, I think, um, over the weekend. We'll be right back. So just a few other comments on that just really incredible story from a Newsmax world that's suggesting that the International Criminal Court is going to hold Israeli leaders and potentially even Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel himself, uh, accountable for alleged war crimes in the midst of this Israeli conflict. This is just showing how the leftist agenda that is pushing more and more toward their own definition and reinvention of justice is so profoundly concerning for the administration of not only a civil society here in the United States, but across the globe. If Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders can't even manage their own conflict um, in a national sovereignty a specific manner, but are contemporaneously being hauled in and arrested by the International Criminal Court simply because they're concerned that this alleged humanitarian aid is going to go to terrorists and their political opponents who literally massacred them back on October 7th, then what does justice even mean? This is the same type of reinvention of this term that we're seeing here in the United States when we're seeing all of this political lawfare and why it is so important for the U.S. Supreme Court that heard the arguments for presidential immunity last week uh, with respect to former President Trump to make the right decision. Because if a future president of the United States is concerned about being hauled into court and being criminally accountable for actions that were taken under his or her official office, then this absolutely has a chilling effect on what a future president can do if that future president, of course, is a Republican. This is never going to happen to Democrats, let's be honest. This rule is all about the leftists and the Democrats wanting viewpoint discrimination and being able to criminally charge their opponents for actions that they don't want to tolerate. Not that are actually criminal, but just acts that they don't prefer. This is why the Supreme Court here in the United States and hopefully the ICC and, you know, and, and hopefully President Biden, we hope, will have a, a sharp a response to this and condemn that type of action. But at least here in the United States, we need a Supreme Court that has a conservative majority to hold an opinion that rightly divides what presidential immunity can and should be versus personal acts. We know that presidential immunity is an absolute, doesn't cover literally everything while a president is in office, but not allow it to go so far as to allow the political lawfare that has been going on and clearly targeting a Republican as a former president that is never going to target a Democrat that's a former president. 
So let's turn to what was the most bizarre headline, I think, of the week. And this is um, unfortunately uh, you know, a little bit less <laughs> severe than when we're talking about international war crimes and so forth, but nonetheless, totally bizarre. Governor Kristi Noem of South Dakota wrote in a new memoir that she, about 20, 30 years ago, killed her dog, literally shot him in the face. And the wider story of this is that supposedly this dog uh, was brought onto their family farm to be a hunting dog. And at 14 months old, couldn't be trained properly. And I think that's uh, really attributable to the owner, uh, but was getting into some neighbor's chickens. And then when Christy Nome said that she tried to, uh, to take the dog away, the dog snapped at her. Well, if, uh, if you are hating your dog, as Christy Nome said that she did, she, was, she wrote, I literally hated that dog, then maybe the dog had a reason uh, to, to snap at her because he, he was concerned. So this dog, Cricket, she actually writes in her memoir was led to a gravel pit and Christy Noem brought her gun and shot this 14 month old puppy in the face, killing it. And then later that day also shot one of the goats on her farm. This is utterly psychopathic behavior and should be roundly condemned by literally anyone with common sense. You don't just shoot your dogs in the face because you call them, and she did, quote unquote, less than worthless as a hunting dog. Give the dog up for adoption. Give him to a shelter. There are so many other ways that she could have done this, but she's being roundly condemned as she should be. And uh, yet there is a contingent of the GOP that is actually trying to defend this behavior by having this total non sequitur that's suggesting that just because human babies are worth more and are more valuable to society and to God himself than dogs, than canines, then somehow we shouldn't be concerned about this at all. So this is what Christy Nome posted on X in response to the controversy. I can understand why some people are upset about a 20-year-old story of Cricket, one of the working dogs at our ranch in my upcoming book, No Going Back. The book is filled with many honest stories of my life, good and bad days, challenges, painful decisions, and lessons learned. What I learned from my years of public service, especially leading South Dakota through COVID, is people willing, people are looking for leaders who are authentic, willing to learn from the past, and don't shy away from tough challenges. My hope is anyone reading this book will have an understanding that I always work to make the best decisions I can for the people in my life. A tough challenge, and your response to that is shooting a dog in the face, a puppy, and then you write about it in your book as if this is going to help, your political career. I mean, the the absolute cognitive dissonance here is wild. This is not turning out for Christy Nome. I think, how she thought it would. And she's one of the top VP contenders for the Trump GOP ticket. Hopefully, she is not one of those contenders at all. But let's get back to this non sequitur from the conservative right. This is what my friend Liz Wheeler, who generally, you know, I appreciate her commentary, but I utterly disagree with her on this. Listen to this. Okay, so Christy Nome, who is a Republican governor and at least rumored to be in consideration for uh, Trump's vice presidential running mate, just published a book. And in her book, she relates a story about shooting her family dog with a gun because she didn't like the dog. She said she took him out to a gravel pit and shot him. And there's a lot of outrage on the internet about this story, um, particularly from leftists who are calling her loony for having killed her family dog. And I think there's a valid argument to be made that this is a distasteful thing to do, a weird thing to do. Um, but here's the thing. This outrage that we're hearing from leftists about how crazy it is, how horrible it is that Christine Noem shot her dog, where is the same outrage when almost a million times a year here in the United States, unborn boys and girls, this is human beings, not dogs, are suffocated, dismembered, their skulls are crushed, and they are killed in the womb. All right. So yes, abortion is a huge problem. I have talked prolifically about pro-life on this show, but that has nothing to do with the issue at hand, which is that Christy Nome put in her memoir that she shot her 14-month-old puppy in the face. I think that we can be morally outraged about that type of treatment of God's creatures without bringing into this a whole pro-life debate. And there are so many conservatives now that are on the interweb saying we shouldn't care about any of the animals because we can't be pro-life and care about puppies at the same time. Well, newsflash to every conservative, I can care about puppies and I can care about unborn babies at the same time. And Christy Nome is a total psychopath. She deserves nowhere near the vice presidency. That's all the time we have here on Jenna Ellis tonight.